In part one, I discussed John chapter one, and I explained some mistranslations that make it appear that Yeshua was his father from the beginning. I explained how John went through a brief history of mankind that led up to Yeshua being made to be his father's ward or his logos in the flesh. The brief history that John summarized explained the beauty of our creator's design by showing that it was all made through, through his thoughts through his logos explain that in the beginning before anything was created that it was just Yahweh and his essence John described this essence as the Greek word logos and the translators translated this into the English word word obviously the written word was not in existence yet so whenever um, in the beginning so John is referring to the very thoughts of Elohim his spoken word that he had his servants record is merely a blueprint that explains his very thought process and his righteousness to us. So in the beginning was Yahweh and his thoughts or his very character and what he is because what we think about defines our character. It is his righteousness. I have defined the word logos before with examples. If you write or speak a description of an object or a person or a picture of something, it is the logos of that picture or person or object. The example I'll give today is a brown haired girl with brown eyes petting a calico cat with green eyes on a park bench gives a partial description of the picture. We still do not know many things about it. How old is the girl? Does she have her hair in a ponytail? Or are her parents on the park bench with her or nearby? Is it the summertime or the fall or etc.? Our Creator's Word is the same way. It partially defines his character, but we need his seven spirits to complete the picture. John went on to say that through him or through his logos, all things were made to be. And without his logos, nothing was made to be. Some apparently do not like it when I use the word logos, but it better describes what our Creator explains His word is, that, uh, what, it did, what it's to be, than does the uh, English word word. Use the English word word, it kind of limits our understanding of what John is saying, and of course, what Yeshua and other places too, and Matthew and other people use the word to record. I use it as kind of like a, a summary word so that I do not have to write or I write an explanation paragraph every time to explain the word, what the word is portraying. So how was the Logos made to be flesh? John tells us in the same text that day. In verse 32 he says, John the Baptist bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. Why did Elohim's Spirit need to be given to Yeshua if he was already Elohim in the flesh? I will tell you why. It is because he was not his father in the flesh. Yeshua was born from a virgin mother, just as prophesied, uh, as prophecy said that he would be. He had no earthly father, but he was still born of, of the flesh. He had a beginning. Yeshua Elohim had no beginning. His very name means the self existing one. From the time that he made man to be flesh in the garden from the dust of the ground he knew that man would go sideways with the free will that he had to give us in order to accomplish his purpose he has showed himself to his creation in so many ways but his creation has rejected him over and over again by making him to be who they wanted him to be and by not believing him nor trusting him and they have done the same thing with his son from the time that he decided to build a family through mankind, he knew that he would bring forth the beginning of his prodigy and enter into him his very essence or his logos. This was all pre-planned before the foundations of the earth. He chose to enter his logos into his son in order to pave the way into his family. After he had finished building the the, um, the 24 elders in the first the first uh, phase but in order to accomplish his design he had to 
hold back until the 24 elders were molded and fashioned by him. They were not resurrected into his family before Yeshua, yet they were prepared and molded prior to Yeshua's atoning sacrifice. If they knew about Yeshua as well, he was prophesied to them to come. They were resurrected after Yeshua's resurrection. We, we find this recorded in Matthew 27, verses 52 and 53. So Yeshua being made to be the, in the flesh was planned by our Creator from the beginning, or from the time that he purposed to build his family through mankind. This is what Yeshua meant when he said in John 8:58, Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was made to be, I am. People twist this to say that he said that he was the I am that I am, or the I exist that I exist, that Yahweh used to describe himself to Moses, recorded in Exodus chapter 3. I must be blind because I do not see Yeshua saying this here. He simply said that he was prophesied to be before Abraham was even brought into existence. In the verses leading up to this, they were asking him if he was greater than their father Abraham or the other prophets, and he answered them. Verse 54, if I honor myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father that honors me, the one who you say is your Elohim. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, then I would be a liar like you are. But I do know him, and I do hold fast to his logos. This must have really riled them up. If you read on, it says that they picked up stones to stone him. I bet they did. They must have been furious, calling them liars and such. Just like many of you out there listening to me are furious with me, telling you that you're deceived and you're wrong and you don't know Elohim because you keep not the commandments, even though John recorded that as well, that if you say you know Elohim and you keep not the commandments, you're a liar. I guess you don't like to be called liars. Yeshua was telling them that he knows Elohim and, and that they did not. He said elsewhere that his logos is not his, but it is his father's logos that sent him. If he was his father, then he would have said that it was his, that his logos was his own logos. It is blasphemous to say that they are the same being, although they certainly are one because they have the, the same logos, just as we must become the, the same by having the same logos as they do for to enter into his family. This is why we were created, to be made in his image, made in his logos, just as his son was made, was, was made to be in his image. He goes on in verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see or to know of my day. And he saw, or he perceived, and was glad. And the Jews said to him, You are not even fifty years old. How have you seen Abraham? Seen in verse 57 is a different word than what John used to record what, what Yeshua said to them in verse 56. They were not understanding what he was saying. They were only hearing him on a physical plane. They were thinking that Yeshua said that Abraham saw his day and that he rejoiced in what he saw with his with his eyes and this is not what Yeshua was saying he said that Abraham rejoiced when his father Elohim let him perceive that he would one day be sent forth it was would one day send forth his own son to be a sacrifice for many he spoke to them in parables Elohim stopped Abraham short of offering up his his son that day do you think that it is possible that he might have went on to explain to Abraham that one day he would raise up a son to himself to be the sacrifice that would atone for all who would come to him? I will tell you it is more than possible because this is what happened. Abraham was tested with offering up Isaac, but Yahweh also meant it, meant it to be a foreshadow of his son. Abraham loved his Elohim enough to obey him and to leave the consequences to him. Yahweh loves his creation enough that he let his only begotten son be sacrificed on our behalf. He manifested himself in human form to talk with Abraham in the form of Melchizedek. Don't you think that he might have told Abraham that one day he would rise up from his seed, a, a savior? From Abraham's, seed, from Abraham's seed, a savior? Of course he did. He certainly told David that he, that he would. Do you think that every story is 
recorded in the, the small volume of books that we have of the history of the first nearly 4,000 years. Of course, he shared with him his plan to build a, a family, and Abraham rejoiced over this. And of course, he told Abraham it would be from his seed, and he also told him it would be his own, meaning Elohim's own begotten son. Even though it would come through the descendants of Abraham. That's why all the prophecies were about this. They knew this was going to happen. They knew that one would come forth from David's loins. Was Yeshua there to see him rejoice, or could he perceive these things because his father was living inside of him, showing him these things? That's right, I said that he was living inside of him, just like they both want to live inside of each of us. Yeshua spoke this plainly the night before he was killed. How did he accomplish this? How does he accomplish it in us? Scripture tells us. With Yeshua, he, his spirit descended upon him like a dove. This is part of what John the Baptist was sent to bear witness of. The Apostle John says just two chapters later that he recorded in John 3.34 because he whom Elohim has sent spoke the words of Elohim because Elohim gave him his spirit without measure. Yeshua had his father's thoughts. He was totally in agreement with him. He had his father's mind. This is what his father accomplished when he gave him his seven spirits without measure. If John was saying in chapter 1 that Yeshua was his father from the beginning, then why here just two short chapters later is he saying that Yeshua's father loved him and he gave him his very own words to speak. It doesn't make sense. And why is John saying that the father gave him his spirit without measure if he was already his father? Folks, this is so simple, but that two-legged trinity doctrine that many of you are holding on to is keeping you from coming into the light. I said that Yeshua possessed his father's seven spirits. Is this recorded anywhere? Revelation 3, chapter 1, and the angel of the called out ones of Sardis write, These things says he that has the seven spirits of Elohim. The book of Revelation is, is John's recordings of the revelations of Yeshua our Messiah. Yeshua is speaking of himself. It was prophesied by Isaiah that Yeshua would be given these seven spirits. He did not have them already. They had to be given to him. In Isaiah chapter 11, and there will come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and Yahweh's spirit will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of Yahweh. Yeshua was this rod that came forth from Jesse. Jesse was David's father. This is very simple if we just believe his word. Saying that he is his father is what makes it complicated. These verses say that he had the spirit of the fear of, of his father. It was given to him. The following verses go on to add even more. In verse 3, it says, And I will make him of quick understanding in the fear of Yahweh, and he will not judge after his the sight of his own eyes, neither will he reprove after the hearing of his own ears. Yeshua said for us to not fear man who can only take away our physical life, but that we should fear his father who can take away both our physical life and our eternal life. He said, I judge no man, but yet my judgment is true. He said this because his judgment was not his own. He said that he could say nothing unless it was given to him by his father to speak it. He did not rely on his own perception or his own hearing. He was given his father's spirit without measure, and he relied on his father's spirit to teach him all things, just as we must. How do these statements of his line up with this verse? They are a perfect match. The next verse says, But with righteousness he will judge the weak, and reprove the humble of the earth with equity, and he will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and he will slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. Is this not what he is returning to do? He is returning with a rod of iron and a sword out of his mouth. In verse 5, And the righteousness will be the girdle of his loin, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. These verses describe him to a T, and it is clear that he would come forth from David's loins, and David came from Abraham's loins. If he was Yahweh already, why did he need to have these seven spirits given to him? Other verses that people try to, that you know, people use to try to prove that he is his father are verses like John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. Philip said to him, Master, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. 
Yeshua said to him, I have been with you for such a long time and you do not know me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Why do you say, show me, show us the Father? See, they say, see, he said that he is the Father. Really? Why not simply read the very next verse? Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Now catch this next verse very clearly here and translate it yourself in, from the text with the concordances. He says, I do not speak of myself with the words that I say to you, but the Father that dwells in me does the works. This might have been a good time to tell us that he was the Father, don't you think? Instead, he says, I'm not speaking of myself. He wasn't referring to himself, he's saying. He's saying he's referring to the fact that he is in me. He goes on in verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me. If not, believe me for his work's sake. He went on, to, went on and taught that as long as we are keeping the commandments and that his logos was abiding in us, and of course he said his logos is not his own logos, but his Father's logos, then he and his Father would also dwell in us. To twist these verses to say otherwise, just to uphold a doctrine that came from Satan's servants is blasphemous. People also want to quote Isaiah 43:11, I am Yahweh, besides me there is no Savior. I want to say, see, if Yeshua is a Savior, oh well, he, 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 obviously he's Yahweh. Well, before you want to hang your hat on this one, you might want to evaluate what Yahweh is saying. There is no deliverance out of this flesh apart from Yahweh Elohim and that he is the one that gives us eternal life or not. His deliverance is offered through his son's blood, but he is still the one that is giving it. He is the one who entered into his son through his seven spirits in the first place. At least if you believe scripture, just like he is the one who wants to enter into each of us through the power of his seven spirits as well. He is the one who created his son. Yes, he created him. He made him to be, just as John recorded in chapter 1. Just as he made all things to be. The Hebrew word used here for Savior means a lot more than just being given eternal life as well. It means to be delivered or to be given safety. It is used 207 times in the Old Testament and applies to different types of deliverance. And there is no deliverance from anything unless he allows for it. And there certainly is no eternal life for any of us unless he gives it. Yeshua said that no one can even come to him unless his father draws them in. Why wouldn't he have said that no one can come to me unless I draw them in? As you should be able to see by now, it is pretty preposterous to say that he was his father or is his father. And as I said in part one, you are calling them both liars if you say so. You wouldn't believe the things people write me, telling me for saying these things. And here they're the ones that are liars, hypocrites. Unbelievable. I had better include a couple other scriptures though, just in case any of you are still holding on to them. Well, Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bring forth a son. And they will call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as Elohim with us. Hopefully by now you can see that Elohim's logos, or that which defines his character and his thoughts, entered into Yeshua. His nature came into his son, just as he wants to come into us. This is all that this verse is saying. Yeshua was without a physical father, as this verse shows, and just as John recorded, he was the only one who was ever begotten by his father. And how did this happen? We are told three verses earlier. But while he thought on these things, speaking of Joseph, behold, the angel Yahweh appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take you, Mary, to be your wife, because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. He was made to, he was made to be by his father, plain and simple. He was created. He had a beginning. His father did not. She was said several times that he descended from heaven. Why did he say this? It is because he did. The Logos that was in him came down to him through his father's seven spirits. We all came from somewhere. Maybe you're from Texas. Yeshua is from heaven. It is his origin. John the Baptist was made to be in order to bear witness of or to testify of this so that we would believe. Why don't you believe him? That's what he was sent to do. 
Yeshua was his father's very character in the flesh. He was and is his thoughts in the flesh. Just as we must aspire to become the same with them in total agreement with, with their logos. And like I said, this is why we were created. John recorded in chapter 1 that when we become sons of Elohim, we are no longer born of flesh and blood, but of the will of Elohim. It is his will to make us to be his children, but we have the choice to want it and to fight for it. Scripture says that Yeshua is sitting at his father's right hand. If he was his father, why would he be sitting at his right hand at the throne? He'd be sitting on the throne himself. I can only think of one more verse right now that people want to throw into the mix, although I'm sure there's others. But it's found in Zechariah 14. In that day, Yahweh will go and consume those nations and consume them in the day of battle. His feet will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. We know that he is sending his son to return in his power and in his glory. And the Yeshua's feet will stand on the Mount. So people say, he is Yahweh, because it says here that Yahweh's feet will stand on the Mount. Yeshua will be wearing the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords on his robe and on his thigh, and his robe will be dipped in blood. I liken this to wearing his father's name, carrying his banner. It's like belonging to a team. You bear that team's insignia. And we are commanded to bear his name as well if you are to become his. He will stand on the Mount of Olives that day as his father's ambassador. If this is not good enough for you and you want to say that he lied all of those who knows how many times that he referred to himself separately, that is certainly up to you. You have free will. People want to even take their false beliefs into what Yeshua said about when he said that he was the he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, instead of just believing him and believing his father. The point is it's just a matter of believing them and believing the prophecies about him instead of twisting translations to say that he was Elohim when he clearly taught that his father was in him. And why not just believe John the Baptist who saw his father enter into him when his spirit descended upon him? I am sure that there are other verses that some of you might have questions about. I'm pretty sure I covered the main ones though. If you want to use verses that came from Saul of Tarsus and his disciples Luke and Mark in order to defend your belief, like Saul saying that Yeshua emptied himself, etc., that is your choice as well. Saul has led billions away from the truth, and he's led you from the truth. This really is a straightforward situation. The only thing that clouds it is the preconceived ideas that we grew up with that came out of the mother whore of Babylon. Just look at the source of where that, that doctrine that he is his father came from. You ought to trust that source indeed. Saying that sarcastically, of course. Nowhere did Yeshua say that he was his father. He said that they were one as we must be one with one another and with him. They were in total agreement because they had the same logos, the same logos that each of us must hunger and thirst to have. Before he left for the garden that night, he prayed to his father. In that prayer, he said, start off before this, but let's pick it up here in verse 21, that they shall, that, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me, and the glory which you gave to me I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and that you have loved them as you have loved me. This sounds a lot like the favor for favor that John spoke of in chapter 1 that I spoke of in part 1. It certainly does not sound like he was giving them a closing prayer that they would understand that he was his father, does it? Just look at all the times that he separates him as being separate in just these few verses alone, just as he did throughout his teachings. You might think that his closing prayer might have been a little different if he actually was his father, eh? He finishes off his prayer with these verses, the following three verses. Father, I will that they also whom you have given to me be with me where I am, 
that they may behold my glory which you have given to me because you loved me before the conception of the world. He loved him before and he conceived anything else of this world because he knew that he was going to sire him and, and to send him forth to bring many into his family through him. And oh, how patient he has been in building his family. How much love he wants to bestow upon us. It is incredible to think about the work that he has gone through thus far to build his family. And his creation has caused him so much sorrow and grief in the process. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but, but I have known you, and these they have known you, and these have known that you have sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. He certainly refers to his father separately a lot, doesn't he? Sounds pretty simple. It's all about the family business.